In this lecture, we're going to talk about um, the second imperfect market structure that we're studying in class, and that is monopolistic competition. Uh, monopolistic competition includes many of the small businesses that we see around us. Um, these fast food restaurants are also examples um, if we're analyzing them as individual franchises, not as corporations as a whole. Um, monopolistically competitive uh, businesses would also include anything in the service industry, places to get your hair cut, places to get your nails done, um, clothing stores in the mall. Um, much of what we see around us in day-to-day -day life is monopolistic competition. So just to get us thinking about um, a concept called non-price competition, which is very important in monopolistically competitive markets, we're going to just talk about a little scenario here. Mac and Charlie each own and operate gas stations across from each other on the edge of town near an interstate highway. There are no other service stations in this town. They are now selling their gasoline for exactly the same price, and they both have large signs listing their price. I think that's a pretty um, familiar seen to most of us. All right, Mac is considering raising his price because he thinks that people will buy about the same amount of gas even if the price is raised a little bit. He figures that he can more than make up for the few sales he'll lose with the higher price for the sales he makes. So Mac is, is believing that demand for his gas is inelastic. Would you advise Mac to do this? Well, I, I think most people would say, no, Mac, that's not a good idea because your gas is the same as Charlie's gas. And if you raise your price, people are just going to go and buy gas from Charlie instead. Now, Charlie is considering lowering his price because he thinks he can take business away from Mac if his price is a little lower. He believes he can more than make up for the small decrease in revenue from each gallon sold by selling a lot more gallons. Would you advise Charlie to do this? Um, I think most people would say, um, no, Charlie, that's probably not the best idea because when you lower your price, Mac's just going to have to match your lower price because um, gas is gas, and uh, you know you're going to just end up decreasing the profit for both you and and Mac as a result. So, um, you know, when firms offer differentiated products, which gas stations not you know are not all the same as you know you know some gas stations have pay at the pump others make you come inside some gas stations offer other conveniences and car washes and you can buy food there and um, there's there's lots of differences some have clean bathrooms some some have gross bathrooms that you have to walk around the back um, to use so I mean there's lots of differences in the gas stations but when people are just coming to buy gas you know gas is gas so can you think of any other things Mac or Charlie could do to increase the profitability of their businesses? Um, things like, let me give you some ideas here. Offering customer loyalty programs. Offering pay at the pump so people don't have to walk inside. You know, having those clean bathrooms that are indoors so you don't have to walk around the back of the gas station late at night when you're driving home um, and you're by yourself because that's always a little scary. <laughs> you never know what you're going to find. Um, things like, you know, offering cards where you rack up your points and every time you have a certain number of points you get a, um, a special prize or a free coffee or something like that. All these are just different um, examples of ways that these businesses can compete with each other without changing the price of their product. So we're going to see non-price competition um, is very prevalent in monopolistically competitive markets because the products that the different firms are selling are differentiated but um, you know there are still lots of other options for people so rather than changing price a lot of times this non-price competition is a more successful way to increase um, profits so let's just review the characteristics of monopolistic competition we've, we've learned these already in the introduction to market structures lecture but again, in a monopolistically competitive market, there are many sellers all competing for the same group of customers. The products are differentiated, meaning they are not identical. They are different. You can tell like who produced it. Um, brand names are going to play a play a part here. You know, the packaging for the products will be different, um, but you definitely can tell the difference between um, different companies in the style or type of product, maybe the location of their of their business and the quality of their product. 
And the demand curve for monopolistic competitor is negative, so it's downward sloping, unlike a perfect competitor, but it's going to be more elastic, more flat, more horizontal than a monopolist, and this is because there are substitutes in the market. Um, one monopolistic competitor does not have the only choice for consumers, so consumers can switch back and forth between um, the different producers and competitors in the market if they want to. There's free entry and exit into and out of the market, so this is something that's very similar to perfect competition. Uh, people can come and go as they please, but uh, they can't just stop paying their fixed cost of production, so if a firm is losing money, they're still going to hang in there as long as they can cover their variable cost of production and chip away at their fixed costs until they can get out of those fixed cost commitments and get out of the industry. And because of freedom of entry and exit of firms into and out of the market, the long run economic profit for monopolistic competition is zero. They're going to earn a normal rate of return. We'll talk more about that um, in the long run lecture. But why is it called monopolistic competition? Because there are similarities to perfect competition and there are similarities to monopoly. So this is um, a, somewhere in between the two. It's closer to, to perfect competition though. I think you'll see. All right, so in the short run, the monopolistically competitive firm follows the profit maximization rule. So a monopolistic competitor is always going to produce where MR equals MC and may end up at one of the following situations in the short run. They may be earning profits. They may break even. They may lose money but continue to operate because they can more than cover their variable cost of production and chip away at their fixed costs. Or they may shut down immediately because they can't cover their variable cost output so they actually do better by just paying their fixed costs out of pocket until they can get out of those fixed cost commitments and exit the industry. So these four options are the same four options that we learned with perfect competition. Um, you know, and, and they could end up at any of these situations in the, in the short run. So let's take a look at these four options graphically. This graph that we're going to see for a monopolistic competitor is going to look very similar to the monopoly graph that we learned about. Um, the difference here is that this graph will represent one producer out of many in the industry, whereas the monopoly graph represented the industry because there's only one producer in the industry. So you'll notice that one slight difference from the monopoly graph is that the demand curve is going to be more elastic since consumers have choices and can switch to a different producer instead if they want to, but we have, you'll notice the demand and marginal revenue curves are both downward sloping. Marginal revenue falls twice as fast as demand because much like the monopolist, since it's a downward sloping demand curve, if this monopolistic competitor wants to sell more, they have to drop the price of all the units that they're selling, not just the additional units they want to sell. Marginal cost curve, we are familiar with this curve. This is the curve that is the mirror image of marginal products. And the average total cost curve is important because that helps us figure out if this firm is losing money or breaking even or earning profits. So this firm we're showing is earning profits because at their profit maximizing level of output where MR equals MC, the average revenue or price per unit sold is greater than the cost per unit of production. So they are earning profits and this is a great situation to be in for a producer and this is definitely one of the, f the four short run possibilities. Okay, another possibility in the short run is for the monopolistic competitor to break even or earn a normal rate of return. And remember, this is perfectly acceptable. And this is where they're going to end up in the long run because of freedom of entry and exit into and out of the market. So here we have our demand and marginal revenue curves, marginal cost. And the average total cost curve here in this situation, you'll notice, is tangent to the demand curve at the profit maximizing level of output. One thing to note is that the lowest point of average total cost is where marginal cost intersects average total cost. So um, at the profit maximizing level of output, they, this producer is not producing at their lowest average total cost. They're not going to be productively efficient. But they are um, still breaking even, so that's a good thing. They're able to cover all their explicit and implicit costs of output because price equals marginal cost at that profit maximizing level of output where MR equals MC. All right, possibility number three is for the producer to be 
losing money but still operating. Um, and this would only happen if at MR equals MC price is less than average total cost but greater than average variable cost. Um, so this firm is losing this much money here but if they were to shut down they would be losing more. So as long as they can more than cover their variable cost of output they will be producing. And what you're going to look for is find the profit maximizing level of output and then find where those three important curves intersect at that profit maximizing level of output. Average total cost, price or average revenue, and average variable cost. And if price is in between ABC and ATC here, then you'll know that the producer is losing money but um, is better off producing in the short run for now, taking a, a loss, instead of shutting down because if they shut down they'd have to pay their full cost out of pocket. Their full fixed cost out of pocket, excuse me. All right. The last possibility here is if the monopolistic competitor can't even cover their variable cost of output and so they're going to just shut down immediately and pay their fixed costs out of pocket until they can get the, out of those fixed cost commitments. So here at profit maximizing output where MR equals MC, again you're just going to look at that level of output and then look for the important curves. So here's price or average revenue. Here's average variable cost. You'll notice average variable cost is higher than average revenue. So they can't even cover their variable cost per unit of output. Therefore, they're better off producing nothing and just paying their fixed costs out of pocket. All right. So another important piece to think about in these imperfect market structures is advertising and that's one of the largest forms of non-price competition that's out there. Advertising isn't free though. It costs firms a lot of money. Product differentiation leads to advertising and brand names. Um, when you promote your product people recognize your product because they've seen it in commercials and seen it in ads. So there's kind of a debate about advertising. Does it exploit consumers and reduce competition because people automatically automatically be drawn to the brands that they recognize or does advertising increase competition by offering a greater variety of products and prices? Firms that sell highly differentiated consumer goods typically spend between 10 and 20 percent of revenue for advertising. That's a lot of money. And as a whole, um, in the whole economy spends about 2 percent of total firm revenue on advertising. So a lot of money goes into the advertising industry. Brand names provide two benefits to consumers. First of all, it provides consumers information about quality when quality cannot be easily judged in advance of purchase. For example, let's say I'm going to buy a pair of tennis shoes. I need new running shoes and I have no idea what running shoes I want, but I see that there's some Nikes on the shelf and I've heard of Nike. Nike's popular. Nike must have good products because otherwise people, everybody wouldn't buy Nikes. So, you know, that kind of gives me some information about those shoes even if I don't know anything else about the model. And it gives firms an incentive to maintain high quality because they don't want to lose customers. They want to maintain their good reputation and keep customers coming back for more of their product. All right, so that brings us to the end of the monopolistic competition in the short run lecture. And we also touched base just a little bit on that advertising non-price competition piece that can apply to any of the imperfect market structures. Um, so just what to walk away with understanding at, at the end of this lecture today is what the graph looks like for monopolistic competition, what the major characteristics of a mon monopolistic competitor are, um, and then the, f the four possible short-run situations that a monopolistic competitor may find him or herself in, and, and what those graphs look like, and, um, and basically what the result would be for the firm.